Good evening once again, and welcome to Bible study here at Cal's Temple AME Zion Church in the city of Sacramento, California. It is a blessing to be in your homes or wherever you may be this evening to study God's word with you. Uh, confession, you know, Bible study is probably the favorite, my favorite part of uh, uh, preaching and teaching as a pastor. Man, it just gives us time to just go through the scriptures and uh, learn, amen, what God would have us to be, amen. I've learned as a kid that Bible, B-I-B-L-E, stands for basic instructions before leaving earth. And so I thank you and, uh, for joining us this evening for the study of God's word on this the last Tuesday of February. The year is just flying by, but it's a blessing to be able to share the heart of God with you. Uh, we're at Romans chapter 9 and verse 33. And as you're turning there, let us open with the word of prayer. Lord, thank you one more time for the study of your word. Lord, and as always, it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Lord, speak right now to your people what you would have them to learn this evening. Lord, I pray that we do not leave this place the same way that we came, but oh God, believe rejoicing in our salvation, Lord, even in Bible study saying, Lord, I'm so glad I went to Bible study tonight in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. And amen. All right. Zoom is working. So let's go. All right. So we're in Romans chapter nine. This is the last verse. And then we're moving into verse uh, chapter 10. But we've been studying here at Kyle's Temple, the true church, we're a Bible-based church producing disciples of Christ to build sustainable communities and families and extend Christ to all. And so we have been studying the book of Romans to understand what being the true church looks like in a contemporary culture. And again, contemporary is not about a city. It's not about San Francisco or Los Angeles. It's not about New York City or Atlanta. But contemporary is a changing culture. We're living in a changing world. The world is moving faster now, probably, than it's ever moved before. And so how does the church keep up? Not that we're behind, but how do we keep up with a changing world? Do you not realize there was a study done that said that had the pandemic not happened, because we were talking about earlier how bad things can happen, but God works um, in mysterious ways to make it work for us. Had the pandemic not happened, uh, the church would have been behind when it came to virtual and e-church ministry, right? That we have based our ministries off of people being in a building. That we we calculate uh, budgets and and ministry uh, and and uh, numbers from what's seen inside of a building, not realizing that the world is changing so much. People are moving and uh, people live far away. I mean, even here in Sacramento, you know, I, I was told there was a time where you could get from one end of the city to the other in fifteen minutes. But now there's traffic and people are moving out side of Sacramento to Roseville and Woodland and Davis and Vacaville and Stockton, but they still want to be connected to a certain ministry, right? And that's their right. And, and But we've always built, you know, wherever you go, find a home church there, but we're moving into a virtual world. And so had the pandemic not happened, that forced the church, it forced us to move into virtual ministry. We would have been behind. I believe that the Lord, one thing that God did in this pandemic is, is that he allowed us to get moving. Come on here. I said he allowed us to catch up to what he was already doing in the world that we kind of neglected and negated because we were used to doing church a certain way. And so now it has forced us to become a virtual ministry. And as I've said before, we have members now in Atlanta, Georgia, and in Utah, we have partner churches in Angola and Rwanda, and I'm hoping to expand that even to uh, other parts of the world so that we can have a greater outreach. But we wouldn't have done that had we just met on Sunday, come to Tuesday, you know, had our little exclusive uh, box of people that meet on 42nd Street. And so God truly knows how to move his church, even when we are uncomfortable. Sometimes he'll do it by force. And also he gave us an opportunity to rest. I know some people are rushing back, trying to get back to church to the building rather because oh, we've been having church i mean good church it right in our home but they're rushing to get back to the building not realizing 
that God uh, is calling some of us to a season of rest and a season of rejuvenation and a season to slow down and stop and sit at your house and read your word and pray and recommit yourself to him. Some of us, you know, we don't do this often, Bible study, but some of us need to recommit our lives back to Christ instead of rushing to go back into a building that really wasn't helping us do better in our personal lives anyway. He's called us to a season of solitude and silence and rest and rejuvenation so that when we go back into or reintroduce back into that particular atmosphere, that particular setting, which is the church building, we'll be a different and a better and a greater person. All right. And so God is using this season to show us who he is and what he can do. Amen. And we have to embrace that. We have to embrace that. And that's all about the sovereignty of God that we've been talking about, right? Because we, you know, we've been reading this. It's like, well, how does that work for now? You know, we we can't explain everything about God, but there's something that if we sit back and listen and look and really get in our word, we'll realize that sometimes God will push us. Praise the Lord. You know, we've been saying, I'm not, you know, I don't do church on that. And God forced us, he pushed us in that way through this pandemic. So yes, all things work together for our good if we allow it to and not be so rigid uh, and so closed-minded and so off-put. You know, there's some people say, well, you know, I I'm doing okay, but I'm not going to participate until we're back in the building where you kind of missed out on a major move of God if you're waiting to get back into the church building. All right, you, you really miss what God is doing in this season. And what happens is, is that you're going to come back to the building and you're going to be around people that have gotten that, that, that flew, that, that flowed with the cloud and you got left behind. So now you're catching up to the move of the spirit of what God is doing in this season. And you missed it because when that season was happening, you decided to be stubborn. So open yourselves up. And that's for somebody that's, I'm really preaching to the choir because you're on here, but that's for you to tell your cousins and them. You say, you know what? You got to get with the cloud. Yes, you got to get with the cloud. You got to go with the flow. God says, yeah, uh, the, 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 the prophet Ludacris said, when I move, you move just like that. Amen. We got to learn how to move with the spirit and not say, well, you know, I'm going to wait until I until normality because it's not going to be normal anymore. This is the way of the church. This is the way we're going to be able to reach people on, 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 in every continent. You're going to be able to reach people in every state places that you'll never go. Amen. Some of y'all ain't never going to go to Utah, but you have people there that you can connect with. And that's a blessing. Diversity is a blessing. Inclusivity is a blessing. If we open ourselves up and stop being stubborn to the move of the spirit, somebody say, amen, amen, amen. I ain't gotten to the verse yet, but I know that the spirit wanted us to hear that this evening, even for me, you know, but but I know that the Lord is is yet using this time even for pastors and ministers and leaders to rest, rejuvenate, rethink, reassess, reevaluate how we do ministry so that when we get back to the church, we can be the true church and not necessarily just doing the same old thing that was not working. And we talked about that last week. You can you can praise God. Do something so long and think that it's the, 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 the creme de la creme and find out that you're 50 years behind the curve. Amen. But God has moved uh, moved us and pushed us in this season, amen, to do great exploits for him. And we praise him and we thank him for that. And I think we need to take a moment to honor and praise God for pushing us. Amen. He didn't pull us. He had to push us. He pushed us to into this new season into this new sovereignty of God that we can see him in new ways and not be so confined to how he used to move. The Lord moves in mysterious ways and we miss the move of God. Hallelujah. Trying to box him into the same old way. God wants to do something new. Amen. So in verse 33, in verse 33 of Romans chapter nine, it says, and we're picking right back up. This is the last verse of, of chapter 10 of chapter nine. It says, as it is written, behold, I am laying in Zion of a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. What is God saying? What is God saying? Even in verse 33. The stumbling over Christ was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 16. Those who trust in Christ will not experience end time shame. Right. So he says, I'm laying in Zion. I'm laying in the church 
a stumbling, a stone of stumbling. That's Christ, a rock of offense. That was Christ. And he said, but if you believe in him, you will not be put to shame. Listen, that's that's the rock that that's the rock. That's the stone that we ought to be standing on. That's our foundation. Let's not let's not get so uh, uh, addicted to church that we that we stumble over the revelation of Christ. What does that mean? Don't don't get so confined to how church used to be, you know, and miss it. You can, you know, the Psalm said, you know, we yeah, we wept when we remember Zion. Like they cried when they thought about the old time way and now they're in this new land. They're being held captive. And, you know, they they got the weeping, but God says, Listen, you gotta learn how to pray praise me in a strange place. Right. So he said, don't, don't, don't stumble over who Christ is because you're trying to hold on to the old thing. You know, embrace the fullness of Christ. When Christ came to the earth, do you realize people hated him? Now, a lot of people loved God, uh, Christ. You know, he was healing people and raising from the dead and teaching and preaching. So, yes, a lot of people loved Christ, but he had a lot of he had a lot of enemies. He had a lot of people that disliked him. And you know who they were? They were church folk who didn't want to embrace the new God, the, the, who didn't want to embrace the newness of God, the revelation of God, the one that they had been waiting for because they were so stubborn in the old way that they missed the newness and the freshness of God. You know, Christ is not stale. Re Christianity and religion and church does not have to be stale. But you know, if you leave bread out too long without a covering, if you leave bread out too long and, and and without it being tied down it becomes stale and molded and sometimes the stuff that we just laid out there instead of embracing the fresh bread the daily bread hallelujah do y'all know we pray the prayer and don't even know what we're talking about give us our daily bread so it, that's not just in our physical or just in our spiritual oneness but even in the body of christ lord give us our daily bread the bread we had in 1990 my god it was good you know, I love that kind of church. Do y'all know that? I mean, I grew up with the dancing and the shouting and the running choirs. I mean, marching in and all of that. And it worked. Oh, my God. It worked for its time. Yes, it did. I mean, I, you know, you got dressed up shirt and tie and pants and shoes. And, you know, you had your jacket and a vest and you had your hymn books and you sang and you stayed there for three hours in the past, preached for an hour. And you had the youth choir and the children's choir. And every sang every Sunday, and you know, you didn't leave church until somebody hollered and screamed and shouted and spit. But and it worked then, and I'm not saying it doesn't work now, but what I'm saying is that there are other ways to worship and praise God that we're not embracing because we're trying to hold on to the bread of 1980. Hallelujah! And there's bread in 2021 that God wants you to eat, and, and you can have the and you can have the shouting and all of that, but don't forget to worship. There's worship music, there's rap, there's liturgical dance. There's other ways to get to express God than just the choir or, or just the, the, there's other ways to do it. And we got to learn how to embrace the fullness of God. Amen. I said, embrace the fullness of God as it comes, even in our personal lives. What worked, you know, that beautiful um, um, Lord's Prayer, that thing worked for you when you first got saved, but there's more than the Lord's Prayer. You've got to get in into an intimacy and into a place of 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 of, of devotion to God where you, you're not you're not satisfied with what you used to have, right? I, you've got to have more. There's got to be more. And the way that there's more is by is by allowing yourself to to op to be open to what God wants to do and the bread that he wants to give today 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 not yesterday not yesteryear and there's nothing wrong with remembering that and saying man you know I do miss it I mean I miss I miss praise breaks you know you know you don't shout out here in the west but you know I miss that I miss and they don't really do it in the south anymore you know that's just a lost art people don't dance and shout but it's okay because you know people were dancing and shouting and then they would leave service and go smoke a cigarette by the car you know so was it authentic was it real probably not so we, we need to just embrace who God is and what God wants to do in our lives and in our churches today hallelujah today and don't miss God trying to hold on to yesteryear don't miss God. Don't be, you know, some people can't even embrace, can't even have a friend because they they mourning the friend that they lost. You know, they can't find somebody because they're 
They're, they're, they're mourning the loss of somebody. And listen, you, you, you were never meant to, to be stuck in one day or one season. But God says, I give and I take away, but I do that so that you can see me in different ways, not so that you can mourn what was or what used to be, but rather so that you can see God in varying settings, right? So I saw God when I had the friend. I saw God when I lost a friend. And then I saw God when he sent me another friend. I saw God when I got married. I saw God in the divorce. But I also saw God when he gave me somebody who was really going to love me for real. Rather than saying, you know what? I ain't never getting married again. I can't stand men. I can't stand women. They can't be trusted. I can't believe they are wasting my time. And get stuck in that day or in that season. God says, no, no, no. See me in every situation, in the highs and the lows, right? And move on that's the word for somebody you somebody's new year's resolution i know we're in, at the end of february and the year's all one sixth of the way done but your new year's revolution resolution this year a revolution yeah your new year's revolution ought to be i'm moving on i clap for myself i said this year i'm moving on i'm not going to stay stuck in what happened or what used to be this year i'm moving on I, I, I'm forgiving. I'm moving past it. I, I'm forgiving myself. I'm forgiving everybody. I'm forgiving everything. I'm forgiving the dog. I'm forgiving the cat, forgiving the fish, forgiving, hallelujah, the person at the grocery store that sold me that old milk. I'm, I'm letting everything go and I'm moving on to the future and beyond because greater is ahead of me. But I can't em, I can't embrace the greater if I'm holding on to the past. Right. So don't don't stumble. Don't stumble over Christ trying to hold on to the old thing. Verb chapter 10. Let's go. Brothers, Paul is writing brothers. Now he's done chew them up and spit them out, but now he's saying brothers. My heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Paul said all of this. Do you not realize that that the, the central issue in chapters 9 through 11? Paul is <laughs> he's saying salvation. He's talking about salvation in varying terms and varying ways. But that's the central topic in, in three of these chapters in Romans, salvation. Paul basically saying, let the folk get saved. Why are y'all trying to inhibit someone from coming to Christ? Paul said, I don't get it. Like y'all, I don't care if you got 200 million members. Why are you trying to prevent one from coming to Christ? And that's a question that we need to really ask ourselves. Why, why is it that we prevent people from coming to Christ? I don't care if it's your family members, your friends, your enemies. I don't care if it's people that you know that you don't know, people that look like you that don't look like you. Why is it that we we constructed these semi walls? That we that prevent people from being free to come across. Well, I don't I don't do no, you do, you know. And as I'm telling you, this is the time for us to really assess our behaviors because some of our facial expressions, you know, some of the things that we say, some of the how we say it, you know, the way we treat people. People can be prevented from coming to Christ because you won't let them, you wouldn't move over or let them in because you was waiting on your friend to come to church and you know they late. But you wanted to sit beside them and that person tried to get in and you told them, no, this is where so and so sit. You need to find somewhere else to sit. And that put them off from accepting Christ because why they do not want to be a part of anything where people act like that. I, you, did you hear me? Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. I, no, no, no. But when when the, when it was time. Praise God for someone to walk down the aisle and they came down the aisle. You looked back and you had the nastiest look on your face like they had spit in your cereal that morning instead of celebrating the fact that they made a decision. Or after worship service, you was in the parking lot talking about they went down to the altar again. They, people hear that and that prevents people from getting what they need from God. Right. And Paul says, listen, my prayer, my heart's desire is not that y'all get more members, is not that you build a new church, is not that you meet your budget, it's not that you uh, have padded pews, it's not that you uh, uh, have your seat, it is not that you sing this, that they sing the song you want them to sing, it's not that you get the pastor that you want, it's not that you elect the bishop that you want, it's not that you get recognized on Men Day, Women Day, church anniversary, it ain't 
ain't none of that. My heart's desire and my prayer is that they may be saved. That should be our central focus as the body of Christ. What do we come to church for? That people can be saved. What do we study God's word for? So that men and women can be saved. What do we sing for? So that men and women can be saved. Why am I a trustee? Why am I a steward? Why am I a class leader? Because so that men and women can be saved. Why do I preach the gospel so men and women can be saved? Why do I tithe? So that the church can have what it needs so that men and women can be saved. Why do I show up so that men and women can be saved? If, if it's anything else, we're doing it for the wrong reason. Everything that we do should be so that we can draw other people to Christ, so that God can work on them like he worked on us and the church can continue to grow. That's our focus. It, I, don't, I don't preach. Listen, I don't preach because I want to. Hello, somebody. Did y'all hear me? I, I'm going to say it quietly because I, I don't want to get out. I said, I don't preach because I want to. I preach because somebody needs to hear the word of the Lord. Somebody needs to know that the heart of the Father is to draw them to him so that they can be saved. So that one day when I'm gone, they can sit in this seat and pastor and preach God's word and lead more people to Christ. That's what our life is about is to lead people to Christ. P get people saved. When you go see your family, you ought to be going over there so that men and women can be saved. When you're talking on the phone, you ought to talk so that men and women can be saved. When you go to work, you ought to work in a way that men and women can be saved. When you go to the grocery store, you ought to shop like, like you want men and women to be saved. Everywhere we go, we ought to be a model of salvation so that somebody can say, something is odd about that person. Oh, something is odd. When I used to go to work, I'm, and I'm so thankful that I don't have to go into the office. When I, used to go, I was happy every day. People were straight. You know, they were the ne most negative. You know, people that work are the most negative. I never understood that. Can we just talk for a minute? I don't know why people get jobs and then they would get up in the morning and go to the job to complain about a job that's paying them to be there. You know, and I would all, I was going, I'm as happy as I can be. You know, you paying me to be here. I can't, you, I can't beat, you can't beat that. In my book, you pay me to wake up and come to your office and do some work and go home. You're going to pay me. And people couldn't believe how happy I was. I mean, just joy every day. I had, I'm sad about nothing, mad about nothing, raining, hot as it could be. Didn't matter to me. You're paying me to show up and do some work. Oh. And they said, why are you so happy? Listen, one, I woke up. Two, I made it here safely. Three, y'all are paying me to be here. Why would I be angry? You know, we, we've we got, and people can see something on you when you just show and become a model of salvation. Did you hear what I said with your big head? I said people will notice something different about you when you become a model of salvation. And that's everything. It ought to, come, it ought to exude up out of you. It ought to come up out of you. You ought to be on aisle seven and just give God a praise. Hallelujah. That the canned green beans was 50% off. Be a model of salvation. Smile at folk. Well, they can't see it. They want to go see it. But smile at them. Amen. Have a positive attitude. People can see the glory of God even through the mask. We ought to be a model of salvation. That should be our heart's desire and our prayer that every family member be saved. Every friend be saved. Every coworker be saved. That should be our heart's desire. That, Lord, don't when the church doors reopen, don't let one man or woman come into our church. The church that our ancestors built so that we could worship and help other people get to Christ. We don't let them leave out and not get a relationship with you. We want everybody to be saved. Verse two, chapter 10, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. Hear this. But not according to knowledge. So so listen to this. The Jews zeal. And sincerity did not lead them to salvation. They were all excited. And we're the children of God. And we are the chosen ones. And, you know, we this and that. And we got this title and this position in the church. And all of that, all of that zeal, all of that sin sincerity, all of that energy was not according to knowledge. It was ignorant zeal, ignorant energy. Ignorant sincerity. The broader principle is that many sincere religious people are wrong in their beliefs. Did you hear what I said? The broader principle is that many sincere religious people are wrong in their beliefs. Just because you're excited about something doesn't mean you're excited about the right thing. 
Just because you're enthusiastic about something doesn't mean you're enthusiastic about it. I've seen churches, they get more excited about men's day than they did about somebody getting saved. I've watched churches go up um, over a choir concert and somebody get delivered and they treat it like a, a Big Mac sandwich, like I mean, like a potato fit. You know, they, I've seen people get, get more energized about what color we're wearing for Women's Day than the fact that they've got children that, that are coming to their church. And rather than loving on them, they treat them like trash. So you can have zeal. You can have energy. You can have enthusiasm, but it's not be rightfully placed in your church. I'm going to let that marinate for a second because I'm talking to somebody. The spirit is talking to someone right now. I ain't got to yell and holler anymore. The spirit wants to meet you right where you are. You've been enthusiastic and energetic and zealous about the wrong stuff. And that's why your spirit man and your church hasn't moved forward because we've been we've been enthusiastic about stuff that's not effective. We get more we get more joy about, uh, you know, whether or not the, the bulletin is printed right. And, and great, great. Gr listen, great to have a bulletin. All of that was wonderful in its day. Uh, blue, you, did y'all hear me? I said it was great in its day. But but what's the point if we're not if it's not drawing anybody to Christ? You can have you can have great zeal, but it'd be wrongfully placed. And that's even true in your personal life. You know, people get all excited about, uh, uh, I'm going to go there too. Somebody get mad. You know, they get, they get excited about their children being able to, to play basketball or they be, get excited about their children uh, playing football or baseball or they're a great singer or, you know, their kid is a rapper or all of this stuff. They got great zeal about their children, but it's wrongfully placed because that zeal and that excitement you have about athletic ability, about musical ability, all of that, that zeal should be placed in making sure that you train your child up in the way that he or she should go so that when they are old and you're dead and gone, they will not depart from you. You can have zeal and there's nothing wrong with encouraging your children to be great citizens and to be great athletes and to be great students. But at the end of the day, that means nothing if they're not a great Christian. I said, that, no. I said it, it don't mean a thing. It don't mean a thing if they ain't got the king. So you can have zeal. I'm, I'm talking about in your, just in church. I'm talking about in your personal life. You can have great zeal about the wrong thing and it'd be wrongfully placed. It meant well, but the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Last verse and we're going home. I'm not going, I'm not going to go off today. Amen. Verse three, chapter 10, Romans. It says, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Let's read that again. I said, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, own they did not submit to god's righteousness many jews did not believe in christ because they failed to submit to god's righteousness and instead attempted to be righteous before god on the basis of their own works they tried to establish their own kingdom within a kingdom that's treasonous that's insurrection y'all know we had just had an insurrection last month january the 6th to be specific where they were trying to establish a kingdom within a kingdom that's insurrection. When you're trying to establish your own principles within a principle, that's insurrection. It's treasonous. It said on the on the contrast of the two ways to righteousness, you can see Galatians 3 verses 7 through 14. If you want to talk, see uh, more about the two ways of righteousness. So we got to. We've got to, I'm telling you, it's dangerous when you try to set your own principles within a principle. God has already established his church. He told Peter, he said, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He's already established his church. What he doesn't need is for us to try to establish our church within his church, establish our principles within his principles. And the reason we do that is because we're ignorant of his righteousness. If we had knowledge, come on, we talked about if we had zeal in his knowledge, then we wouldn't be walking walking ignorant in righteousness that is not of God. I think that's enough. What do y'all say? I think that's enough. I don't want, because I know somebody's mad, you know, well, well, grandma and great grandma did this and they started this church. My granddaddy started one too, but I'm telling you, everything that was started by people don't make it right. We got to make sure that the principles are God found, that you can find everything, everything that we do in our church ought to be found in the Bible. 
everything we do. I don't care what it is. Everything we do, it ought to be found in God's word. And if it's not found in his word, then that means we got zeal without knowledge. It's ignorant zeal. And, and we ought to eradicate that thing and establish God's principle in God's church. Otherwise, it's not the true church. The true church is not one church. It's not just Kyle's temple. It's the true church. It's the church that's founded and established on and in the principles as typed, written through God's word. That's what it's about. Okay, I'm done. That's all I'm getting. That's, I, I can't give y'all no more because somebody's mad. But that's good. You know, sometimes the, the, the thing that makes you mad is, is that one area that you need to work on. That one place that really gets on your nerves when somebody says something like, why you don't change or why why you think the church ought to stay? You know, that one thing that really irks your nerves is, that is usually the one place that you need to improve on, that you need to allow the spirit to just come and just wash you with his word and wash you with the blood and just get that gunk out of your life so that you can move forward. Yeah. Yeah. We we got to we got to we got to do some de, de uh, some de establish. I don't even know that's a word. We need to dis, de, de establish some things in our churches and de establish some things in our personal lives that aren't found in God's word. Otherwise, we're we're just running, running fast nowhere. And that's not what God wants. God wants us running to something. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling, which is in Christ Jesus. We ought to be pushing and pressing toward the mark, not just running fast to say we've had good church because good church will not get you into heaven and good church will not get you into righteousness. And being in the building will not get you any closer to to God than being in a garage will make you a better car. You're a human being and you've got to have it in you and not go looking for something to, to, to go come to you through osmosis. Amen. All right. So let's, let's, let's reassess our, let's do some homework. Let's all think of one thing that you, if you could, you say, you know, if there was one thing I could change about my church, this is what it would be. And this is one thing, if there was one thing I could change about myself, this is what I would change. Cause I know it's not founded in God's word. And send it to me. I'm, I did. I did ten of y'all and send it to me, so we can talk about it. Let's do some homework this week, because this is the end of Love Month, and I think you know one of the the major places we need to love is ourselves. And love yourself enough to be able to find an area in yourself. Love your church enough to be able to find an area in your church. So you know, if I could change one thing in that church, this is what I would change. If I could change one thing in my life, this is what I would change, because I know it's not it's not in line with God's word. And let's work it out together. God, search us. Search our churches, search our lives so that, Lord, we're not running fast nowhere. But, Lord, give us a zeal that's founded in the knowledge of who you are. God, give us energy that is Holy Spirit driven. Give us, God, a, an enthusiasm, an enthusiasm that's found in your word. God, I thank you for every watch person, for every person watching. God, for every listener. And I pray, oh, Lord, that we will be able to do some introspection and some inspection. God, to see where we can improve so that, Lord, we do not get stuck, stagnant, and stale. But, Lord, we will always be moving to the future for what you have for us. Because, God, we know that the best is still yet to come to those who make a decision to embrace the newness and the freshness of God as found through your spirit. Thank you, God, that you never change. But we thank you, oh, God, that in a changing world, you allow us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we will never be embarrassed and never be ashamed to be a witness for you in a changing world. Touch us now. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. God, that we will not be the same. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please join us now for our prayer meeting going on right after I shut this YouTube down at 1669900928. The next is code of 691161088. And again, if you have any prayer requests, you can certainly put those in the comments or the chat. Or you can also email us at ktamyzionchurch at comcast.net. You can also call us and leave a message at 916-457-8015. And we will lift those prayer requests specifically. Remember that the fervent prayers of the righteous availeth much. God bless you. Hope to see you next week. And most of all, hope to see you on Sunday, 830 for Sunday school and worship service at 9 a.m. Both are Pacific Standard Time. Amen. God bless you.